Uh, welcome to this uh, course, uh, Introduction to Radar Systems. Since Lincoln Laboratory was formed in 1951, the development of radar systems has been an integral part of our initial mission, uh, developing an air defense system to protect against a, a polar attack from Russian bombers in the early 50s. But it's also been uh, the development of radar systems has been uh, a major part of many of our programs at the laboratory. Given that, and given that uh, very few courses in radar are available at U.S. universities and have been for decades and decades, the laboratory has been involved in uh, a significant educational program for our staff members to not only keep them abreast of the latest radar technology developments, but to educate new staff members uh, as they come into the laboratory at their different educational levels of the bachelor's, master's, or PhD, to introduce them to radar systems and technology. Uh, in 2001, I believe, we realized that a lot of our sponsors could use some of this education too to help them to do their work and we developed a course that this set of lectures is derivative from. That particular course was an intense three-day course for our sponsors, uh, military officers and government civilians, uh, those involved in the procurement of radar systems and their technical evaluation and their operation. And uh, not only with the Department of Defense, but also with other government agencies that we do work for, like the FAA and NOAA. Uh, and, and so what we did was we put together a course for their level of knowledge that they'd come into the course with. A typical person coming into the course might be a lieutenant colonel, uh, a very smart person, and he or she would have maybe have a master's in business administration. They might have some engineering background, but it might be in chemical or mechanical engineering. They might come from a service academy where they had a diverse background in education. But many of them would not have, they would have had a college degree certainly, but they wouldn't be as involved in the, the, the formalism and have the advanced degrees that many of us at Lincoln Laboratory have. So we put this course together to teach them the basic concepts of radar and, and the technology and the vocabulary of radar so that when we brief them and explain to them the different areas of radar technology, why one technique was better than another for rejecting uh, clutter and seeing targets and, and that sort of thing, or all sorts of things, they'd understand the vocabulary. They know the difference between the beam width and bandwidth words you'll get to know. And so we put together this course. And uh, this course is, again, three days, very intensive. Now, there's some things that this set of 10 lectures certainly doesn't have. It doesn't have the laboratories. It doesn't have the, the demonstrations, the tours of facilities at the laboratory. And it certainly doesn't have certain lectures on operational military radar systems that our covenants don't allow me to present to this public audience. But this is the core of the basics of what radar is all about. And there are many people uh, uh, outside of the government who asked us to make this course available to them, particularly military contractors. They have many people in their organizations that they felt this would be a useful course for. Not their engineers who are experts in radar, but people who work in support and administrative areas. Um, and likewise, as I look at the potential audience for this course, there are many in diverse fields in America where a very basic course in how radar works would be very useful. Uh, you might be a patent attorney who has come across a patent that involves radar, and you'd like to understand the basics of the nomenclature of what's going on there. Uh, it might be you work in the government in the Arms Control and Development Agency and your background is in the law. Uh, you might be uh, in, in the automotive industry and radars are being looked at for colli collision avoidance. 
small, compact, and expensive radars. You might want to get an understanding of what this technology can and can't do in a general sense. So the, and that's just the beginning. There are, there are a plethora of people. You might be a civilian air traffic controller. Uh, a civilian pilot who wants to know how the radars work that see and keep them safe. So there are lots of different people that this course will be useful for. And this is a, a first basic cut. We, of course, at the laboratory have a, a series of courses which delve higher and higher into the technology efforts. And if this course is successful, um, I hope to put together the next level up, where this would be the introduction and then there would be an intermediate, and etc., which would um, be of use to people with need of uh, a deeper intellect a deeper knowledge, excuse me, of the formalism and the mathematics that goes with this. Okay, first I'm going to introduce uh, the whole subject of radar in the first lecture. In other words, in the first hour we're going to do the whole course very quickly and very lightly. Uh, first I'd like to acknowledge that, um, let's see, about 2000 uh, early, uh, six, seven years ago, I taught a course similar to this for our entering bachelors of science uh, graduates who would come to the laboratory. Did the whole thing myself. Certainly when one would put together a three-day intensive course, you don't want to see uh, 10 or 15 hours of Bob O'Donnell in a row or even interspersed with uh, labs and lectures. So we had a whole series of uh, our best lecturers at the laboratory and experts in these different fields uh, work on my uh, set of lectures to modify them and, to, and, and make them optimum for this new audience. And here I acknowledge uh, Eric Evans and Andy Gerber who provided the uh, managed support and guidance and overall uh, help in putting this, to, not help but guidance in putting this whole course together along with a, a dozen or so of the key people who took my course and we, we all worked together as a team and, and got the visualizations, the view graphs, to be the best way to help augment the words that the lecturer would say to communicate just how radar works. And these people have just been marvelous and I'll probably acknowledge uh, through the different lectures an individual person or two as they as their lecture when it's clear that you know they've been just a major contributor in, in all of this. So it's something you don't like blame me, give them the kudos. Okay. So as I mentioned before, and this is just to recapitulate, it's one of the many courses we have at the radar. Uh, this one this lecture you'll see, set of lectures is relatively short. It's ten lectures. Originally uh, Dr. Evans and I have given this set of uh, view graphs uh, to, uh, as a, as a six-hour tutorial at um, uh, Electrical Engineering Symposia. And I'm going to be taking more time to go over things. That was compressed, where the certain lectures would be a half an hour, a certain 45 minutes. It was a time constraint of putting as much as we could in the three days. Uh, that material is, pr is going to take longer because I have the, uh, the freedom to go over and add more texture uh, to make the course, uh, I hope, a little more, a little less like uh, uh, a marathon and more like uh, a walk in the park, uh, easier to digest intellectually. But it will be ten lectures. Um, we're going to divide the lectures uh, the introduction lecture will be probably be broken into two pieces, one a half an hour, maybe the other a half an hour, which I'm just going to let the flow go to say the material, take the time, but not make the lectures, each individual piece of a lecture, each quantum, so to speak, uh, more than a half an hour, so that you can watch a half, of a half of the introduction in a half an hour, then the other half in another half an hour. Uh, in terms of the scope, as I said, basic concepts and terminology is what you'll have. We're going to have a minimum of mathematical formalism. And as with all good courses, you tell people what the prerequisite is. And really it's a college degree. Because if you have a college degree, you've probably, in all probability, you've taken a basic course in the physical sciences, which talks about the very basics of electromagnetism. And also, um, you're going to have taken at least a course 
in mathematics as part of your general education requirement, which you'll have a solid understanding of algebra. And that's about what we're going to start at the ground at the uh, at the the ground floor. And the first lecture, to some people, may seem uh, is quite pedantic, but we'll move on. I'd rather start a little lower and go over certain very elementary concepts and build them up rather than miss a bunch of the audience. I already mentioned who the course was for and that we have other more advanced courses at the laboratory that we'll be working about. So this is really the, the, the outline of the three big things we want to go over. It's really two big things because the course agenda is at the very end and that's just uh, one view graph going over the outline of the agenda. We're going to spend a chunk of time on why people build radars and what they're for in very simple terms. And I'm going to use, you an, use an illustrative example uh, from World War II when radar was first developed to show you the impact that radar had in a very major way uh, in the strategic outcome of the Battle of Britain. Wow. You know? And we'll go over uh, the basic concepts of the very basics of, of the flow of a radar and, and what the basic vocabulary is. And then we're going to take apart each piece of the radar later in a lecture and go over it in detail. Okay. What radar is able to do is, so to speak, lift the fog of war. What do I mean by the fog of war? Uh, war is utterly chaotic. Uh, Eisenhower said that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing him, that uh, uh, all planning, is, uh, plans in war are useless, but planning is indispensable. And when he said that first part, that plans are useless, it's because you just don't know what's going to happen. Uh, all of you have probably are watching this have seen either Saving Private Ryan or uh, the HBO series Band of Brothers. Uh, the airborne troops landing God knows where, far away from where they're supposed to. The utter chaos on Omaha Beach. Supposedly, intelligence said it was going to be defended by uh, conscripts from Eastern Europe. And at the last minute, the Germans had brought in a Panzer division. Uh, a lot of things that were supposed to work didn't. Uh, going ashore was supposed to be amphibious tanks. The waves were high, and they all just about sunk. It was just an awful lot of uh, unexpected happened. And so the ability of not only generals who will run a whole army during that dynamic essence of a war, but the colonels who run their big chunk of it, uh, a brigade or, or a regiment, uh, the lieutenants that run a company, they want to see what's in front of them, know what's there. And radar is able to, to, to wipe away that fog of war. And certainly you can see on the left-hand side in that view graph, that smoke is uh, on the, 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 the banks and the, the, uh, the cliffs of, of Normandy is metaphorical and, and very uh, vivid of what the fog of war that those brave soldiers were facing when they went ashore at D-Day. And if you go to the Pacific, um, just the, the banging together of uh, the, the, the general that was in charge of Iwo Jima had 21,000 troops on Iwo Jima, and he said a million troops in a thousand years would not be able to take it. Uh, the Allies said, we're going ashore with the usual number, three and a half times that number, and we're going to take it in five days. Well, it took them 25 days and innumerable deaths and heroism, and it was utterly chaotic. Uh, you, could, you could mention uh, time and time again the unexpected, and so often you'd like something to tell you what's ahead of you. Okay, so we have military means of sensing. That is to say, what's out there? Electronic systems and, and, and they can be divided up into electrical, optical, infrared systems, radar, acoustic, and other. And I'm not going to focus on the electro-optics or the acoustic or other sensors, but just on radar and what their functions are. What is it that they can do? They can give you surveillance to tell you, are there targets out there that we should worry about? And you can track them, 
follow the targets and see where they are. Direct the uh, uh, interceptors to those targets to knock them down. Use radar to identify the targets. Identify from airborne radars targets on the ground where you can do surveillance, reconnaissance, map where troops are, detect more moving targets both in the air and on the ground and in space. Do air traffic control to keep track of your aircraft, whether you're in a, uh, certainly in this military environment, but air traffic control radars in the civilian environment, very important. You can also put small radars on missiles to help the missiles seek and find targets. Now, what are the attributes that radar has, if you had to list? It can see long distances. If I get up on a mountain and I look out in the clearest of days, I can see an aircraft 10, 15 miles away maybe, a big jet. Uh, you can see hundreds of miles with a radar. And also you can see in day and night, and you can see in all weather. You can see through weather. Um, you can locate, here we say in three space, that means in both height, angle, and just to know exactly in space, X, Y, and Z. You know, where the target is. And radar is reasonably robust to people trying to uh, countermeasure it. That is, with put adding noise, uh, jamming the radar, as it's called, uh, or dropping so-called chaff to give false targets. It's reasonably robust to handle that. Okay, now I want to go into an example, and this is really history to show how radar made such a, a big difference. Uh, in 1936, uh, Great Britain New War was impending, and it built a series of radars um, at these 21 locations where you see the dots. And this was called the Chain Home Radar System. Okay? And it was all operational in the summer of 1940 when the Battle of Britain started. And Germany started um, trying to bomb Great Britain into submission. Uh, here we see on the right a, a picture of three of the towers which supported the antennas. This picture was taken uh, about a year ago uh, by a tourist, a Robert Cromwell, and uh, these still stand over on the, uh, by Dover. That, that's the radar site at Dover. Now, the antennas that were part of this radar uh, none of them exist. And this is a visualization from technical documents that describe the radars on what this radar system was like. It had redundant antennas, one on the right and one on the left. And the, and the frequencies of the radar were, the frequency range that the radar operated in was 20 to 30 million cycles per second that it emitted the pulsed radiation. That's a wavelength that corresponds to 10 to 15 meters, 30 to 45 feet. The, the antennas were quite simple. They were wires, dipole arrays, eight high. And the, if you look at this particular configuration of antenna, it reminds one uh, it was built at this high frequency because that was the frequency that they could build transmitters in those days. They couldn't build transmitters well. They were just starting to, when the war began, build transmitters of smaller wavelengths, which you'll see later imply smaller antennas than these large uh, structures. The azimuth beam was, was about 100 degrees, and it had a peak power of the pulse of energy of about 350 kilowatts. It was later raised to 750 kilowatts. And pulses of energy were sent out about 20 times a second, excuse me, I think it was about 15 times a second, and the pulse width was about 20 microseconds. And that radar had the ability to detect a German bomber at about 125 to 150, and on one of the papers it said 160 miles, okay? And it used one set of antennas to transmit and another set of antennas over here to receive. If we go to the next view graph, Here's what those antennas look like in detail. They are steel towers 360 feet high, and uh, a string of dipoles 8 high. And this particular, at these wavelengths, the beam that went out had a big null. The beam went out, and then it had another 
called a side lobe, but there was a big empty space. And it had another antenna, O, which was a set of four dipoles which filled in that null. When we deal with propagation, you'll understand more about this effect of the multipath at, at, at lower frequencies and what it looks like and why it gives you detection issues. We're also going to study in detail antenna structures. The receive antennas were sets of cross dipoles. So this system was able to see way out 160 miles that the Germans were coming with one of their raids. And remember, they were coming at night. Now, the British had about 1,400 fighters, and they were dispersed at many airfields. And with little warning time, if they didn't have this radar system, which gave them great warning, the British would, wouldn't be able to concentrate their limited forces to attack the concentrated German forces coming at them. And so there'd be an unevenness to the defending German fighters protecting their bom bombers and the British interceptors that wanted to knock them down. The bombers would have got in, dropped their bombs, and got back before the British were able to do much. But with this extra warning time, it allowed the British to get their fighters, their Spitfires, and their Hurricanes off the ground. And that timely warning allowed them to focus their interceptors and achieve numerical parity with the attacking Germans. Why was this all, all just important? The Germans at this time wanted to invade Great Britain. They knew they couldn't invade Great Britain without air superiority. They didn't have such a great navy relative to the British, and the British had kept theirs in their harbors up in the fjords in Scotland. And if an invasion started to come, they'd bring down their navy and sink their, the invasion barges. So what the, British, uh, the uh, Germans had to do was get air superiority. And it turned out, in the Battle of Britain, they could not achieve air superiority. And the reason was is because the chain home system allowed them to concentrate their fighters and wear down the Germans to the point where they said, we just can't do it. It's an interesting anecdote that even though once the Germans attacked the chain home antennas, they never really understood uh, what that these were in a crucial radar system that provided that extra warning for the British. And this really um, allowed the Germans to, well, excuse me, it didn't allow them. It denied them air superiority, and consequently, the invasion of Great Britain was po postponed indefinitely. One can just imagine if the Allies did not have Great Britain as a staging area, the, the great difficulty that it would have been invading Europe later on in the war. So that's a, gr a great example of how radar really made a difference in World War II. Okay. Since then, we have built, and uh, the world has built, all kinds of different radars that do many, many different things. Here's a collage of photographs of a, of a great number of different radars that do surveillance and fire control. Uh, and I'll just uh, spotlight one or two of them. Uh, this is a photograph of a, uh, a phased array radar. That's a radar that electronically scans. This particular one is down in Cape Cod, and it gives warning, uh, during, particularly during the Cold War, of Soviet, if there was an attack from Soviet submarine-launched ballistic missiles. Uh, here's the uh, Patriot radar for the Patriot Air Defense Missile System. Uh, this is the, actually the first phased array, electronically scanned phased array, that was ever built in the, in, in the world. It was in, uh, it's down in Florida at Eglin Air Force Base. Still operates and, and does the, the majority of the measurement and cataloging of satellites that are rotating around the Earth. Uh, here's a missile defense radar system. And, uh, and here is, on these faces right here and here, are the phased array radars with about a 10 centimeter wavelength. The thousands of elements in each one of these two faces. There are similar faces in the aft portion of the ship. And they uh, provide the, uh, they're the eyes of the, of the carrier, of the battle group, and, uh, and do air defense uh, for the fleet. 
Now when we look at airborne and air traffic control radars, uh, here we see a picture of an air traffic control radar, an FAA air traffic control radar. There's one of these in uh, each one of the hundreds, a uh, couple of hundred biggest airports in the United States, and, and they keep track uh, of all the aircraft within 60 miles uh, of the terminal. Uh, here we see an airborne radar on a KC-135, uh, and the antenna is located in this rotating radome. Here's a photograph of that antenna. This particular radar uh, mechanically rotates in azimuth and electronically scans uh, also. The fleet uh, have uh, airborne radars that uh, give them warning. These planes can get up high and give the fleet warning if there's an attack to the fleet. And fighter planes have in their noses aircraft, uh, radars that uh, will tell the fighter pilots uh, when they're many, 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 many miles away if there are aircraft heading their way. Uh, there's also uh, radars in the Global Hawk unmanned air vehicle. And then there is a class of radar called instrumentation radars that very accurately and precisely measure the characteristics of targets. A number of these are located on, in Kwajalein and the Marshall Islands of the ones I've shown you. Uh, uh, this particular radar uh, has, I think, uh, oh, seven or 800,000 pounds it is. It's, a, it's a, just huge. It's so big that it has railroad tracks that it rotates on. And here is the facility at Millstone Hill, uh, the Haystack Radar and the uh, Haystack Auxiliary Radar out on Millstone Hill. And there's a 120-foot dish uh, antenna, similar to this, under the radome, and that emits radiation at just three centimeters. And that building an antenna that precisely is just is a quite a feat, 120 feet across and you have to keep it to be a parabola to a tenth of a wavelength or a tenth of three centimeters. So an engineering marvel to build that radar is way back when it was built. Okay, so now we're down to the basics. What is radar and how does it work? Well, uh, here we see a visualization of an antenna and uh, behind it, of course, is a transmitter and a receiver in a, in a, a, a building a shed or whatever, uh, and that antenna will take the emissions, the microwave emissions, from the transmitter, and a pulse of energy will be transmitted. It will go out and it will propagate through the atmosphere, and then it will impinge on a target. And here we see visualized a, an aircraft, and that target will then scatter some of the energy back to the radar where a switch will turn off the, uh, uh, the transmitter, and earlier it did after the pulse, and listen for echoes. And that echo, the reflected pulse, will be sensed by the radar, and from the delay time of going out and back, one can measure the range from where the antenna is pointing. You can measure the azimuth and elevation of the target's angles. From the size of the echo, its amplitude, you can measure the target's size. It's so-called radar cross-section. We'll get to what that is in a bit. And also from looking at the frequency of the radiation, uh, the shift in the frequency of the radiation that comes back, you can measure the speed of the target, and also other features with processing, such as imaging. And the words radar come from radio detection and ranging. Uh, the, the acronym, these words were used initially when radars were developed, when people uh, were dealing more with radio frequencies, and they didn't really want to say microwave detection, microwave electromagnetic wave detection and ranging. Okay. Now, what part of the... I've been alluding to the fact that these are electromagnetic waves that we're transmitting. And I want to, I want to let you know what part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we're dealing with. And here we have a... Uh, a, a table with some visualizations, that's courtesy of Berkeley National Laboratory, 
which break up into, it's a logarithmic scale, it breaks up into, each one of these units is a factor of 10 in wavelength, and there's uh, something that tells you how big it is, like 10 to the minus 1, and this is in meters, that's the size of a baseball. And radio waves are very long waves, say that. They're the size of houses and soccer fields. Uh, and then when we get down to very, very short waves, we are dealing with like uh, a water molecule size waves, x-rays, gamma rays, and in here are visible waves. And the wavelengths are a millionth of a meter, so-called, you know, a thousand angstroms. So very, very short. Microwaves are right here in the middle. And, and radio radar frequencies operate in the microwave region, and some radars a little bit down in what's known as the very high frequency, ultra high frequency, and high frequency region, but pretty much in this region here, where we're dealing with wavelengths that typically are about an inch to maybe as tall as a human being. That's generally ballpark, what the, the, the radiation that today's radars. There are some radars that operate in the millimeter wave region, and there are some radars that operate up in uh, 10 meters, 10 meter wavelength region. But most of them, the sizes are down in here. And these correspond to certain frequencies. I'm going to show you how the frequency and the wavelength are related in a minute uh, through the speed of light. But these frequencies correspond to uh, uh, 10 million up to 10 billion cycles per second or waves per second, periods per second. And you'll hear the words gigahertz and megahertz, and I'm going to show, tell you what those acronyms mean in a minute if you're not familiar. Okay, so what are the properties of waves? Every wave has a wavelength, and what does that mean? Here we have a, a simple periodic wave. It's a sine wave, and it's, if you were looking at a, a wave rippling along on a brook, you know, if you drop the pebble in and see that wave go out, there's a peak and a trough, and the distance between the two peaks is the wavelength. That's called a period. The distance is a wavelength. The time it takes if we to watch that peak go to the next peak is the period of the wave. And one over that period is the frequency, the number of peaks per second that, you, that go by. And they're related through this formula that the frequency of the wave is equal to its speed and since we're talking about electromagnetic waves, which travel at the speed of light, it's the speed of light divided by the wavelength in meters. Now, the speed of light is very fast. That's 3 times 10 to the 8th, or 1 and 8 zeros meters per second. That's 300 million meters in a second. And in our normal units, it's a, we deal with feet and miles. It's 186,000 miles per second. Okay. Now, for the wavelengths that we're talking about, these are frequencies that this corresponds to. So a 3 gigahertz radar, which the, an air traffic control radar would have the one I showed you, the wavelength is 10 centimeters. Okay. Uh, and these, the, these show you the correspondence, and they're just related through this formula. Okay. The next concept I want to bring about is phase. You can see that there was that up and down periodicity, and you can measure the phase of one wave relative to another by looking at where one peak is relative to the other. In this case, we have two waves that are offset by 90 degrees. So we call that a 90 degree phase offset. And the algebraic expression for this wave is its height or amplitude times the sine of the phase angle. The phase angle over a period goes from 0 to 360 degrees, 0 to 2 pi. Okay? For engineers, they think I'm going too slow. Lawyers are barely remembering this from their trigonometry, probably. Anyway, uh, and we see down here, this would be the algebraic expression. This is going to be very important, that difference in phase, because sometimes if I add the two 
waves together, it's important what the phase is one relative to the other, whether they add constructively and reinforce or destructively. Okay. Now this talks about that constructive or destructive addition of two waves. In the upper left, we have the uh, constructive addition of two waves. The peak matches the time of the peaks here, and we come out with a wave which is twice the height and the same frequency. If the waves are out of phase by 180 degrees, the peak of one will correspond to the, the trough of the other. If this is plus A, that's minus A. Add them together, you get zero. You come here at the zero point, the zero will add with the zero. So when two waves are out of phase by 180 degrees and you add them, you get zero output. If they're partially in phase, we have partially constructive, we'll get an, an answer for the addition in between. Now what we have, if we have just random noise that's coming out, they'll add together and there'll be a partial because they, they're not in phase because the co non-coherent noise just doesn't have coherence at all to it. It's the sort of the addition of a whole bunch of random coherent signals. It, and, but the randomness is in the phase. And when you add them together, you'll get some addition and it will be in between but it isn't as much as you can't get the full coherent addition from non-coherent signals, which is what this tells you. Now here we have an example of, I want to go back there, of, of the concept of polarization. To describe polarization, I have to describe to you what an electromagnetic wave is and how it's generated, and that takes a minute. And right after that, we're going to take a break. Um, an electromagnetic wave is generated in the simplest form by taking an electric charge and accelerating it up and down. If you accelerate a charge, you get an electric field that varies with time. And that, that, an accelerating charge is a current that's changing. And that current that's changing generates a magnetic field. And Maxwell in the late uh, 1800s figured out how this all ties together mathematically with a set of equations which really describe electromagnetism. Okay, These are called Maxwell's equations. And with Maxwell's equations, that's the mathematical description. And what that, that says, basically, is that when you have an accelerating charge, you generate an electromagnetic wave. And the energy that's transmitted in that electromagnetic wave comes from the charge, the moving charge going up and down. And in the simplest terms, that's how you generate electromagnetic waves. Now, the polarization is the orientation of the electric field vector. Okay? Now I want to go back. And here you see an electromagnetic wave propagating out in this z direction. And you see that the E field, the electromagnetic field up here, is vertical. It's going up and down. And that's referred to as vertical polarization, when the electric field is up and down. If it was an electromagnetic field that came from accelerating the charge horizontally, the electric field would be moving back and forth horizontally, and that's called horizontal polarization. And you can make, we'll, we'll go later when we talk about antennas, we'll talk about other kinds of polarization. Here's an example of the electric field for when it's vertically polarized, the wave is, and here the horizontal polarization example. Now I'm going to take a break, and uh, we'll take a, a cut to the tape, a break, and then we'll come back and continue the introduction. Uh, this is part two of the introduction lecture of the Introduction to Radar Systems course. In the first part, just to recapitulate the last view graph of the first part, we went over how electromagnetic waves are propagated. They consist of an electric field and a magnetic field at located at right angles one to the other. 
and the direction of propagation of the electromagnetic beam is perpendicular to those two vectors. And here you see a little movie, a visualization of the propagation of an electromagnetic wave. We also introduced the concept of polarization, of vertical and horizontal polarization, where vertical polarization is when the electric field moves up and down vertically, and horizontal polarization when the electric field vector of the electromagnetic wave moves horizontally. Okay. Now let's continue. Okay. The radar bands over that region uh, from one, say up to about, excuse me, you can see here uh, above the wavelength and frequency for the whole region of the electromagnetic spectrum from wavelengths of one kilometer down to one nanometer. That's a, uh, a thousandth of a millionth of a meter, a billionth of a meter. And from a frequency of one megahertz just up to uh, uh, over a mi million million hertz. Okay, way past the visible spectrum. In this area, from here to here, is the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that radar operates at. Okay? And here we have it blown up down here. It's roughly, we're blowing up the region from 1 to 12 gigahertz, and we have some other frequency bands that are notated by these letters that are up in the 16, 35, and 95 gigahertz region. Now, the areas that are colored are the portions of the electromagnetic spectrum that are allocated for use in radar, for, for use of radar. These allocations are made by the International Telecommunica Telecommunications Union, and Th these allocations are made so that one usage doesn't e in, uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum doesn't interfere with another usage. And historically, for a long period of time, radar has operated in these bands. In the early days of radar, these bands were given letter nomenclature. Uh, L band being at about 1.25, centered at 1.25 gigahertz, you can see here up in the from 3 to th 3.7 or 8 gigahertz the S band region and C band is about 5 and a half gigahertz and X band up in the 9 uh, 8 and a half to 10 and a half gigahertz region and here are the wavelengths that those bands correspond to so the the radars when you hear someone say and if you get used to it uh, working with radars and radar people, they'll say that radar operates in the X-band region. And pretty quickly you learn that the, the wavelength is about 3 centimeters and it's up in this 9 to, nine to 10 gigahertz range. And 5.5 to um, centimeters and 5.5 gigahertz is where C-band is. And roughly S-bands around 3 gigahertz with 10 centimeters and LBN is about 1.2 to 1.3, just in general ballpark terms, and 23 centimeters is the number I seem to have remembered. And UHF um, is, at, uh, is at 435 megahertz, and VHF is uh, uh, down lower in frequency. Okay? And these correspond to, to different... Um, wavelengths. Okay, now the IEEE is the Institute of Electri Electrical and Electronic Engineers and they have a, s a set of radar standard bands and the uh, in the in that set of standard bands um, th these nomenclature are used for the letter standard for radars that operate in these particular frequency ranges. The typical usage of radars uh, that do search as their main and only mission are down at lower frequencies. And missile seekers, which are would be radars that operate on missiles, 
and missiles have rather small diameters that you're going to need antennas that are very small they in turn, and you'll see why, uh, need to operate at much higher frequencies and the radars that do both search and tracking functions would tend to operate in this regime and then tracking and fire control radars would operate at these uh, frequencies where you'd be able to get higher resolution and you'll see later on uh, why the, the, these uh, they have the higher resolution easier it's easier to obtain at those frequencies now this view graph is probably one of the the, the view graphs that, if nothing else in the course, you'll end up remembering this view graph because you're going to see it an awful lot. It's a block diagram of how a rate of the different functions performed by a radar and how the radar works. You can describe it in pretty simple terms how it works, and it breaks down the functions, the different functions of the different parts of the radar. We call them subsystems. If you consider the radar as a system as a whole, it's got a lot of little subsystems. And uh, we'd just like to follow you through what happens when you, say, turn on a radar and send out a pulse. The first thing you do is you have to generate a waveform and then amplify it in the transmitter and then it goes to a switch where uh, that allows the energy, the pulse of microwave energy to go out to the antenna but none to leak into the receiver but that it goes out to the antenna and the antenna directs the energy towards the area in space that you'd like to illuminate with microwave energy to look and see if there's a target there. The pulse will then go out into the propagating medium, the air, the atmosphere and, um, and when it hits a target, some of the energy will uh, be reflected off that target and the amount of the energy will de depend on the effective electromagnetic size that the electromagnetic uh, wave sees. Uh, that's called the radar cross-section and that energy will come back, a small portion of it, to the, re to the antenna. In the meantime, the transmitter has been turned off since right after the pulse was transmitted and the, and the receiver is listening for echoes. Okay, The farther out the target is, the longer it's going to take for the pulse to go out and the echo to come back. And so the, the, the delay time before the echo from a target is received is a measure of how far the radar is from the target. So that antenna collects that very small energy in the millionths of a watt and then it goes into the receiver and then because processing of that data to optimize the ability to detect the target it is much much easier to do digitally and reliably to do digitally th that echo is uh, transformed from the analog or continuous domain to the digital domain with an analog to digital converter and those samples from the analog the digital converter sampled at each little moment of time in range or in time delay then go into a signal processor where the target uh, echo is processed to get the best resolution you can out of that received pulse a process called pulse compression to optimally process the data and also to look and see if the frequency of the return echo has been shifted and if it has, and we'll get in a minute to what that means, you'll be able to t measure directly the velocity of the target, you know, separate it from un unwanted uh, backgrounds. So we'll also do in the signal processor the process called signal processing. Then the data will go into, this digital data will go into a detection process where we'll look and see what targets are higher than a threshold size, which ones we should say are, which echoes are, aha, that's probably a target. And then we'll go into a process called tracking and parameter estimation where we'll keep track from one set of pulses to another of targets, detections, and correlate them from one scan of the radar to another, one set of pulses, so that we can say that indeed this set of detections at these different times 
are all from the same actual physical entity out in space and get a really good estimate of the range and bearing and velocity and motion of that target. And then that data is displayed on a console, uh, a digital display usually these days, and also the data is recorded so that we can understand later what's been going on with the radar. Now all of these different boxes are very important and the rest of the course what we're going to be doing after this introductory lecture is focusing on each of these different pieces of the radar one at a time and in a sense we, we've gone over with, we'll go over each of these blocks with one or two view graphs in this introductory lecture but then in the lectures that follow each one of the, those, those little pieces like uh, for instance the Doppler processing portion will be a whole lecture the antennas will be a whole lecture the target cross the uh, the target cross-section properties of different targets will be a whole lecture. Understanding the propagation medium will be a whole lecture. Detection, etc., etc. And that will, will build up your knowledge from starting with the idea this is a radar, now this is a block diagram. And lastly, one other lecture, which is actually going to be the second lecture, is how does this all fit together? You know, the prop... How do we build a radar that has the right properties, the right power, the right size antennas, so that it will be able to see targets out, say, aircraft out 200 miles? How do you know what power? The uh, equation that relates all those properties of the target and the radar and how far away you can detect and that sort of thing, it's called the radar equation. And it's an essential element of how we build radars. And we'll be doing, we'll be studying that in the next lecture. Okay. Now let's go over that point, the radar equation, just for a moment. Uh, here we, for this example, we have a, a radar located on a ship, and it, the two key parameters that tell you how how what, your ability to see targets are your power and your aperture. You know, the aperture is the size of the antenna, its diameter, and the transmit power. The more power you've got, great. And the bigger your aperture, the more you'll be able to focus that energy to hit a target. You know, we ought to collect it to receive the, the uh, reflected echo. So we transmit a pulse out. Uh, it, it, we've got a target here with a radar cross-section cross sigma. And then we have a distance from the radar to the target. Now, what in rough terms, how much energy do we get back given all these properties? Okay, first we've got you know you're going to get more received energy back if you increase the radar power. So we've got a term in there, the transmit power, and then we've got another term, which is the gain of the transmitting antenna, which is four pi a over lambda squared is the gain of that antenna. That's how much the directivity you get over isotropic. And then we have a spreading factor. That is because as the energy goes out, it drops off, the, uh, the energy density drops off as 1 over r squared, and that ha has to be factored in. And then all throughout this process of transmitting, hitting the target, and receiving, there are a set of losses, things which are inefficiencies in the radar that are just, I call it the humanity of the radar, that you lose energy when you go from the physical transmitter to the antenna because you send that energy through waveguides and the waveguide is that the energy goes through, it heats up a little bit and you lose some energy. There's going to be energy loss in the attenuation in the atmosphere. There's going to be uh, yeah, all kinds of different losses, and we'll get into them later in detail when we study the radar equation. But you have to, you know, divide by those losses to find out that receiving energy. Then, uh, the greater the cross section of the target, the more power that will be received. So that's a multiply. And then, for the there's another spread factor of one over r squared because the reflected echo is going to be sent back to the radar. 
and it's going to that you'll have that energy density of the echo is going to spread out. Okay, and then the bigger your antenna, the bigger your antenna will be able to receive that energy. So there's another factor A, and then the longer you listen, you're able to listen for the target, the more power you'll get in your receiver. So these are all the components that go in, come into play to say how much received energy we get. We're going to look, spend the whole lecture on this radar, on the radar equation in general. Now there's a fundamental term which we, uh, quantity, which we use to describe how powerful, uh, how the ability of the radar to detect targets. And it's, it's the received signal energy over the received noise energy. Okay? And here we have a visualization of what could be the, uh, the, what the receiver hears as a function of time. From one, you know, from, it could be from, uh, it, just, it just listens. A pulse went out and then what do we hear? Well, you're going to hear the ambient noise noise that's generated in the receiver just because it's at room temperature there'll be the the antenna will collect microwave galactic noise it'll collect noise from uh, uh, power lines man-made effects all kinds of different we'll get into that later but there is noise back there that has nothing to do with a real target and then there'll be a received signal from the target you know after the pulse goes out, hits the target, and comes back. You'll have a received signal. And the signal-to-noise ratio is the ratio of the received signal energy to the noise energy. And that's how we characterize. And you, and you typically want a signal-to-noise ratio that's about 20 to 1. You know, like you'd like it to be about 20 to 1. That's a good number. But we'll get into that. That's just in a just in a general sense. Okay. Uh, there's another issue that comes up when discussing radars, and radars to a large extent are the domain of electrical engineers. Uh, during World War II, a lot of people who developed radar were physicists, but today it's it's an engineering field. But a lot of people who work in the radar field studied math or physics or the sciences. And there they write their numbers down in what's called scientific notation. Uh, and, and there's sort of the ordinary way we write numbers we learn, I'd say, in grammar school or junior high, uh, a number like uh, 1,432.648. Okay. Now, scientific notation would say you'd write that as uh, 1.4 times 10 to the sixth, you know. Uh, and so if we have a number that's like 10, the scientific notation for that would be 10 to the 1, 1 times 10 to the 1, you know. Now, in dealing with radars, there's a lot of times where we want to look at ratios of powers. It might be uh, the ratio of the, of the gain of one antenna versus another antenna. And engineers have found they like to do, rather than dealing with scientific notation where you'd multiply all the, the, uh, the small numbers between 1 and 10 together and then you'd add all the exponents of 10. They like to convert the entire number into a power of 10. And that power is an odd number. And they, they have a relative, uh, a relative value of two things and they measure it on a logarithmic scale. And it's, ex it's a, an entity called a decibel. An example of that is the signal-to-noise ratio when it's expressed in decibels. Uh, if you have a number like, say, 20, okay, in its natural units, 20 is the ratio of the signal power to the noise power. Okay? If you take the logarithm to the base 10, you get 1.3. That means 10 to the 1.3 power is 20. So you, you take that 1.3, you multiply it by 10, and 20 in natural units is 13 dB in, in, in dB units. So that 10, when you plug this in, uh, the logarithm of 10 
to the base 10 of 10 is 1, so 10 dB is your answer. And if, if the number was 100 uh, for the signal to noise ratio power, uh, it would be 2 would be the power of 10. And you multiply that times 10 and you get 20 dB. And so you can see that quite easily you can notice that you just take the power of 10, multiply it by 10, and that's the number of dB. So 10 dB is an order of magnitude. Okay. Now there's another thing, and here are a few more things. What happens when you have uh, this ratio is, is, is less than, it's a fraction, like one-tenth? Then these numbers become negative. So a factor of one-tenth becomes minus 10 dB, a factor of a hundredth becomes minus 20 dB. And another factor we always do, things, you do back of the envelope calculations, a factor of two turns out to be 3 dB, and a factor of a half minus 3 dB. So that's something that um, even as a, a fresh PhD getting into the, many years ago, getting into the world of radar, I had to learn and pick it up because that's the jargon that people use, the notation rather than the jargon. It's just a different language. You may have heard it, and I put this in. It may be just ice cream to you if you were, grew up as an electrical engineer in the academic world. But if you, if you didn't, this is uh, where the definition is. Now I'm going to talk about some terminology and, co and concepts uh, about pulsed radar. Usually, with most radars, a, a pulse of energy is transmitted, and then the radar listens for a while for echoes, and then transmits another pulse. And here we have power that's transmitted, and then here we have during this time would be, without the noise of course, the uh, time that the ra receiver, the radar receiver would be listening. And here we have a little target return. Now first of all, I want to just, this is first of all to define a whole bunch of terms. When we turn the radar on and you're transmitting at full power, the, that power that you're transmitting is called the peak power. And the length that the transmitter is turned on with that pulse of energy is called the pulse length. Okay, The duty cycle is that fraction of the time that the, t that the transmitter is turned on. Well, this timed between pulses is called the pulse repetition interval. So if you just divide the pulse length by the whole pulse repetition interval, you get the fraction of the time the transmitter is turned on. That's called the duty cycle. Okay. Now the average power is just the peak power times the duty cycle. And that's the average power that you're transmitting. Uh, the, the frequency that we are transmitting these pulses out is just 1 over the time between the pulses. So 1 over the time between pulses is the pulse repetition frequency. That's often referred to just, it's the PRF. Uh, a 10 hertz, hertz is once per second, 10 hertz PRF would be one pulse every tenth of a second. And continuous wave is when the transmitter is on continuously. And then the duty cycle would be 100, because the transmitter is always on. Now if we take for a, just one radar, there. If we take for a radar, what would be some sample numbers? And they vary over the place, orders of magnitude. Uh, in this particular set of examples that I picked, we have a peak power of a megawatt. And we're transmitting, this is just to give you an idea of orders of magnitude of how these numbers can run. The pulse length here is 100 microseconds. And the time between pulses is one millisecond. That's one thousandth of a second and one hundred millionths of a second. The duty cycle, when you just divide them, turns out to be 10%. 10% of the time, the transmitter is turned on. Okay, The average power is just that peak power of one megawatt 
times the duty cycle of 10 percent and it gives us an average power of 100 kilowatts with this radar. Now with one millisecond being the time between pulses, the pulse repetition interval, the pulse repetition frequency is just one over that or 1,000 hertz or 1 kilohertz. Okay? And so this will introduce you to the nomenclature you'll be seeing later. Now I, I used a lot of kilos and megas and gigas and here are a set of numbers in scientific notation and standard notation and what the Greek frequency would be and how they are used in a radar with different um, observables. Like for instance, if times can be very short, one millionth of a second, you know, okay? And micro is the Greek prefix you put next to this abbreviation for second, and the Greek letter mu, and that would be a microsecond. For a thousandth of a second, milli is the prefix, and the abbreviation would be msec for a millisecond. Okay? Thousand, we're used to kilo is a thousand. A kilometer, a thousand meters. Uh, uh, and then we go up to a million. We know a megawatt is a million watts, it's a common a Greek prefix. And that could be a megahertz, a million hertz, a million times per second. Or it could be a million watts, a megawatt. And giga is the billion, a giga hertz. Uh, 10 to the ninth, 10 to the ninth hertz. Well, we're now back with part three of the introduction lecture, uh, lecture one of the Introduction to Radar Systems course. Now, what are these pulses we send out? Uh, one minute I'm telling you that we're sending out waves. The next minute I'm saying pulses. Well, what do we transmit? Do we pulse transmit waves or pulses? In fact, we do both. What we do is we turn on the transmitter and we send out a wave which is modulated or varied by turning it on and then a little later turning it off. And this is a, a and what you'll usually see in a visual depiction of a pulse is not the up and down of the sine wave, but just its envelope, as it's called, the pulse envelope of the electromagnetic wave. Okay? And notice this particular electromagnetic wave, the frequency is perfectly constant throughout the whole pulse. Okay. And that's what we have up here, a pulse at a, sec of, at a single frequency. And its envelope would be up, over and then down. And if we drew the frequency of this pulse as a function of time, it would be constant. There's one waveform that we use, and we use it to get a better accuracy out of a pulse. When we're making a better range accuracy of the precise location and range of the target. And we can do that at the same time by having long pulses, which will give us lots of power. And we can do that by either changing the phase of the frequency of the pulse as it's the pulse is being transmitted. And this particular example, what we're doing is we're changing the frequency of the electromagnetic energy in the pulse as it's being transmitted. We're going from a lower frequency to a higher frequency. And here's a visualization of that. And that is happening linearly. The frequency increases linearly along this length of time that we're transmitting. And that's called a linearly frequency modulated waveform. We'll talk about that later and why we use it. But I want to bring in the definition now. Now, I've mentioned that in, in a qualitative sense earlier, and it makes you know, perfect common sense. You send out a pulse of energy, it's going out at the speed of light, it hits a target and comes back. Well, um, if one target is twice as far away, uh, 
it's going to take twice as long for the echo to come back. And what is exactly the algebraic relationship between the target range and when you measure that echo is coming back relative to when you transmitted the pulse? And that's what this goes over. The how, in the simplest sense, how we measure range. We, we send out a transmitted pulse, it hits the target, the reflected pulse comes back, excuse me, okay? And so the, the time that it takes to go out and back, the round trip time, that's the time between the transmitter turns on and when we receive it, it's the round trip time, and the pulse goes out and back at the speed of light, so it's speed, and so we know that the range is the velocity times the time. But the range that the target goes out and back is twice the range to the target, because it's got to go out and then back. So there's a factor of two here. Twice the range to the target is the speed times the round trip time, because that time is to go both ways. So the target range is the speed of light times the, the echo, the time from the turn off to you hear the turn off the transmit. Transmitter goes on and off till the echo comes back, that round trip time, divided by two. There's a factor of two in there. Okay. Now I want to just reiterate uh, this concept of gain. We went over it a little bit quickly. Here we have on the left the visualization of an antenna, a tower, and on top of it is a, uh, a little transmitter with an antenna that's sending energy out isotropically in space, uniformly in space, so that the energy a pulse wave, say, goes out like an expanding sphere. Okay, It's going in all directions equally likely, all angles every equally likely a sphere expanding. We call that an isotropically radiating antenna. Okay. Now the antennas that we build, we want to focus the energy in one direction. And the uh, amount of power that we're able to focus that energy, the maximum amount, is over what you would for an isotropic antenna is called the antenna gain. And you can see here a parabolic dish antenna. When we get in and discuss uh, antennas a little more, we'll go over why parabolas and all that sort of thing. But the, the gain, the antenna gain, is just the increase in power over an isotropic antenna. It's the definition of the gain. Now I talked a little bit about propagation, and I alluded to the fact that as the radar beam goes through the atmosphere, things can happen. And I just want to mention quickly that there are four things, and we're going to spend the whole lecture, we're going to expand this view graph in the third lecture of the course into a whole lecture. And we're going to talk about these four things. As the radar energy propagates from the antenna to the target and back, the atmosphere will attenuate the signal. Okay, It'll interact with it. Turns out water and oxygen in the atmosphere will attenuate it. Also, some of the energy can, from the beam can bounce off the Earth, come back up, and reflect up and interfere. You remember those waves, constructive and destructive interference? So that at some angles you'll have a, an increase in propagation, though, constructively add, and some they'll destruct. You'll have, you'll have a thing called lobing. We'll talk about that. So reflection off the Earth's surface is important. And depending upon the characteristics of the atmosphere, the radar and the ground and the edges that, it, that the wave goes around, you can have bending of the beam, and the beam can bend over at low frequencies over the horizon that you could that your eye would just see over straight line propagation. And in addition to that, 
the fact that the Earth's atmosphere decreases in pressure, temperature, and the humidity, the water content. Those changes, because you all know, you know, at down at low, like uh, there's less atmosphere on Mount Everest, but that change in atmosphere, that change in, the re in, in, in what is the uh, index of refraction, which is the ratio of the speed of light in a, in, in a vacuum to the speed of light in that atmosphere, that change in the index of refraction, which is a measure of the density, causes the beam to bend. And we're going to look at that and how that happens and, and what it, how it affects the radar. Okay, now we're going to have a, just a little bit more. Uh, you know, I probably said three sentences before about the radar cross section. I want to now spend a view graph. We're going to have a whole lecture on the radar cross section of targets. As we mentioned when I went over very quickly in the radar equation, what we have is an incident power density of watts per meter squared, power per unit area. And that's going to hit the target. And the radar cross-section is the effective cross-sectional area of the target as seen by the radar. An effective area, well, its units you'd expect to be meters squared, length squared, an area. And that and that's that factor in the radar equation which tells you to that wavelength of microwave energy how big did the target seem. Now when I look with my eyes at an object I'm looking with very very short wavelengths and the electromagnetic cross-section I see are the optical sizes of things. You know something that's an inch by an inch physically is an inch by an inch. But at microwave frequencies, the effective area can be sometimes bigger or smaller than the physical size of the target. Okay? We, we all know that um, people have made airplanes that are physically quite large that appear to be an awful lot smaller than the physical size of that target. You know? And so we're going to talk a little bit about that and uh, generally about radar cross-section. Okay. Next we're going to spend a lot of time talking about signal processing. One aspect of signal processing is that part called pulse compression. Another is Doppler processing. And here I'm going to, I said two sentences a couple of view graphs back, I'm going to spend a view graph. You know, we're hit sometimes with a dilemma. The accuracy with which you can measure in range, in, in a simple pulse, is just the pulse width. You can't tell whether the tar if the target is a, a, a very much smaller than the pulse, you can't tell the range any better than the resolution of your instrument to measure it, the pulse width of the, of, of, of the, of the transmitted pulse. So y if you increase the pulse length, you can get more energy on the target, but you lose in range resolution. And that's, but you want both. This is something you can do. What you can do is you can transmit one of those linear frequency modulated waveforms. And, uh, and here is a visualization of what one of those uncompressed, unprocessed pulses would look like. And then what we do is we send that through some processing, it's called a matched filter, and it's the processing that optimizes the signal-to-noise ratio. And then we get out a compressed pulse, which is ex very precisely where within the range corresponding to that pulse width the target actually is. So you can literally see within a pulse where it is. And this process called pulse compression is a, is a signal processing function. Okay? And notice just up here where we have a, a radar antenna. Of course, we know there's a transmitter and receiver behind it, and it's transmitting out a pulse. And the, if the length of the pulse is one millisecond, that corresponds to a range of 150 kilometers. 
So if we wanted to transmit uh, a pulse that long, full of that much energy to see a target far away, you haven't got very good range resolution at all. That's just a little visualization to say, hey, if we modulate with change the frequency of the pulse and then send it through a match filter and then do the process called pulse compression, we can, a thousand to one, we can find, depending on how we do the process, 100 to 1, 1,000 to 1, 10,000 to 1, big numbers, we can see where within that pulse the actual target is, get our range resolution down, and at the same time have a big wide pulse to do it so with lots of energy to see the target. I'm going to spend an, a, a big chunk of, a, of one of the lectures on pulse compression and a lot on signal processing. Now this talks about the whole concept of bandwidth. Okay. Now you saw before with the linear um, FM waveform uh, how the frequency went from one one number to another number. It linearly changed in the course of the pulse. Okay. That frequency extent that the frequency changed over the course of the pulse is called, for a linear FM waveform like we show here, that's the bandwidth. Okay, And when, when we process it through pulse compression and convert the time to, to range, the width of the pulse, the, our resolution, is the speed of light divided by twice this bandwidth. So if we have a high bandwidth, like as, visu as is visualized here, and then we do pulse compression. When the denominator gets bigger, the, the answer gets smaller, so we'll have much better range resolution with wide bandwidth. Now what else does this say? Well, it turns out bandwidth is easier to get at higher frequencies absolute amount of bandwidth than at smaller frequencies. Because it's pretty easy it, to get about bandwidth of 10 or 15 percent of your center frequencies. So if you're at a radar that's 1 gigahertz, it's pretty easy to get a uh, 100 mega, a tenth of a gigahertz or 0.15 gigahertz of bandwidth. If you're building a radar whose central frequency is 10 gigahertz at X band, you can get bandwidth of 10 percent, say, a gigahertz. And that is a lot better, a factor of 10 better range resolution that you'd be able to get because you can get better bandwidth at the higher frequencies. Okay. Now what does this mean? Why is bandwidth important? Why is that range resolution important? This could be any target. It could be an aircraft. It could be a missile. It could be uh, uh, just any complex target that a radar was looking at. But what I've plotted here, and I've left off the axes, and uh, it, it just just to give you a rough qualitative idea, if I have a radar whose resolution in range is very fine, say it's. Uh, uh, of these tick marks. Let's just look at this whole length is one, two, three, four, five, six, almost seven marks. And say I have um, my range resolution is very, very small, a fraction, a small fraction, one of these tick marks. Then I'm going to see all the different scattering points on this target. I'll see as an individual different scatterer, I'll see the tip, the edge of the tip, right here, where this, this cone turns into another radius. I'll see uh, uh, these different points. Where I'll see a, where, where this stage of the missile is a juncture. I'll see that right here. I'll see the fins in back, and the back of it I'll see. And as I have lower and lower bandwidth, it'll just appear to be one big bump. So for understanding the characteristics of a target, no matter what that target is, higher bandwidth is very important. 
And with very low bandwidth, I can't tell much of anything about the target. And with high bandwidth, I can tell a lot more about it. That's why bandwidth is important. You saw this visualization before. In the red, we have the noise. And then we had a target here in the center. A detect, uh, okay? Now I'm going to bring in the concept of putting in a, a, a threshold. How do we tell that a target is there and it's not noise? Well, what you have to do is to set a threshold saying, if the power is greater than a certain amount when I'm listening, yeah, it's probably a target. And that's in the case where the noise background, excuse me, the noise background is moving up and down. I want to point out that the noise is a random variable. It means it's randomly going up and down. Now there's a small probability that it can go very high. But it's most probable to do what its average is. Okay? And to just have a little bit up and down is not too probable. And not very probable that it'll go up. But sometimes the noise can go above that detection threshold and we call that a false alarm. We thought there was a t target at that location, that range, but it's really the noise fluctuated above it. Okay? And here we have a target detected. And over here in blue, we have a weak target that was really there, but it was below our threshold. And we missed it. So we can have, so in fact, because targets, all, all targets you're going to learn don't have a steady return. Some do, but a sphere would, you know, any orientation. But complex targets like aircraft, the target will fluctuate up and down. Or propagation could be all sorts of, or its aspect angle could be sh changing, and that could change the return that you get. Uh, so you've got uh, literally the target's a random variable and the noise is a random variable. Here we have dashed line at the root mean square, it's sort of the average noise level. You can sometimes miss a target because maybe you don't have enough power, it's, it's very far away, or, or lots of different things. So you can have missed targets and detected targets and false alarms. And this is all, there. It's, it's a probabilistic process. We're going to study that probabilistic process in one of the lectures on detection. Now, when you have a target, and it's like that one that was of weak in the other one, it, it, you, you might want to add together the return from different pulses. And if we take pulse, here is what you see the voltage of a signal that's buried in the noise. The signal-to-noise ratio is less than 1 in natural units, or less than 0 dB. If we coherently add them together, remember keeping the target, the target phase, you know, uh, then the target will move up, but since the noise is random, it won't move up as much. And what will happen is the signal to noise ratio will be increased by n, the number of pulses that you're coherently integrating. Okay. Now I want to uh, go over the Doppler concept. I'm sure you've often uh, had a, uh, a, a, say a car went by. You, uh, most often, I think most of us, it's a train going by. You're at the station and you hear the train. Its whistle blows as it comes into the station, but it doesn't stop at your station, you know. And you hear a high-pitched tone of the, of the whistle. And then after it goes by and you listen, maybe you haven't noticed this, the tone is lower, frequency. It goes, sort of, okay? What you're hearing when that happens is the Doppler effect. And, and the Doppler effect literally says that the frequency that you hear depends on the, the motion of the emitter of that frequency relative to you. So if I have a target moving towards me, the, carry, the carrier frequency will be increased a little bit because of the Doppler effect. And it will be decreased a little bit if the target is going away from me. Okay? Now, this visualization shows you sort of how that, and it, how that happens. We have a wavelength here, and we're sending out a, a pulse of energy. 
Remember the wavelength is, is equal to the speed of the wave divided by the frequency. And say we have a little man here right at all the peaks. And here moving at the speed of light. And here we have our target. And it's moving towards the man at a velocity v. Okay? Now, when the first man hits that target and comes back, he's going to head back. Okay? Now, when the second man heads back, the target is going to have moved closer than when the first man hit it. So the distance between these two guys is going to get less. They are frequent, that distance being the distance between the peaks. So the frequency is getting higher. And as we see, the other man coming, okay, so that the distance which between the peaks, which was greater here, is less here. The wavelength has gotten shorter, frequency higher. And that's called the Doppler shift. This is a nice little cartoon that shows it. Okay? We're going to be able to use the Doppler shift to separate targets that we want to see that are moving from backgrounds that are moving slowly or aren't moving at all. Okay? And that's why Doppler is important. Clutter returns, which is a term used for all that stuff out there in the, that we don't want to see that are real targets. Things like rain clouds, things like flocks of birds, things like buildings, things like the ground, that the, air, that the radar's pulse illuminates and energy comes back. We don't, we're not interested in them, if, if we're looking for aircraft. You know. We're going to want to reject them. And we're going to use that using the Doppler effect. Okay? Particularly if we have an airborne radar that's looking down at a target on the ground, you've got to take into account the fact that both the radar and the target are moving, and that's going to make the situation very complicated. But Doppler lets you separate things that are moving from things that aren't. That's the message I want to leave you with. And when we look at the relative power of the Doppler spec, the relative power versus velocity of different kinds of clutter. We see that land clutter, and this is a logarithmic scale. Each one of these is a factor of 10. Uh, land clutter is very, very high. And then sea clutter. And then rain. And chaff. Chaff is aluminum dipoles that people throw out of airplanes or eject from different entities when you want them cloud up the sky with targets. Uh, and birds, discrete targets. The fact that this is broad means it's diffuse. They happen over a lot of velocities. And here we have our target. This target's up at 100 meters per second, a couple hundred miles an hour kind of thing. It's an aircraft in its radial velocity. You can see you ought to be able to separate them. So we're going to use that to great degree. Here we go back to our block diagram. So we've hoped in this lecture, we've gone through all these different pieces very, very, very lightly. In a sense, you've had in this first introductory lecture sort of uh, radar an hour and a half. What the whole course is going to do is give you eight, ten times that knowledge. Okay. And now let's go over the agenda before we adjourn for this lecture. This first lecture has been an introduction. We'll move on to the radar equation. Then we'll study propagation effects, the target radar cross-section. And then in, we'll look over the detection of signals and noise, followed by pulse compression. I'll probably break these down into a part one and part two of the lecture. Antennas, uh, radar backgrounds, that clutter we just talked about in chaff. And the different ways we do signal processing, so-called moving target indicator and pulse Doppler techniques. These are techniques of seeing, of rejecting clutter and seeing targets in their presence. Then tracking and parameter estimation of the targets, followed by a lecture on transmitters and receivers. Okay. And here is a, some different references.